Hello, today on Charis we're going to talk about books! Specifically, books that I read in June 2019, the first of which is The Salt Path by Raina Wynn. I just got a new retainer, so I'm very lispy today. Um, you know, in like six months time I won't have a lisp because I'll be able to not wear a retainer 22 hours of the day, but for now you're gonna have to deal with it. This is a memoir, it came out last year and Raina and her husband, uh, Moth, they, in their 50s they lost their home, their family home farm in Wales to a bad business decision and an even worse friend and they basically became homeless and they had no income either and then the same week their house got repossessed they found out that Moth has this degenerative disease which basically means he's in a lot of pain a lot of the time and finds it hard to move and um, at this point in time they were like hey how about we like walk the southwest coastal path instead of sitting here and waiting for council housing let's just like do something we've always wanted to do this and it's gonna be horrible because we only have 48 pounds a week to survive on, which is his disability benefits. Um, but you know, let's just do it and get through it. And oh wow, so heartbreaking. So this is like a 630 mile walk um, around the southwest coast of England. So it's, uh, maybe it starts in Dorset, um, Devon, and then all the way around Cornwall and then back through Devon to Poole. And, um, I like really connected with this book because Cornwall is an area I know quite well like we have a family house down Cornwall I go there every year um, and I've really enjoyed reading nature books recently that are about like just our interaction with 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 nature and just being in the vastness of space and being able to issue the frustrations of like daily life in a city this is one of those like heartwarming and heartbreaking kind of books um, there's a lot of struggle in there, but then there's also a lot of perseverance. The next book I have to talk about is Hello World, How to Be Human in the Age of the Machine by Hannah Fry. Um, I know Hannah Fry because she does a Radio 4 podcast called The Curious Cases of Brotherhood and Fry, uh, which is a kind of question and answer science-y based podcast. Um, but yeah, Hannah Fry is a mathematician and she wrote this book, also came out last year, and it's just about algorithms and what they're doing in our lives and how they control a lot of our lives. So the kind of things it covers are justice, medicine, cars, art, crime, and how like algorithms are interact with all of those things. I think this is a really good book. It's a really, it's a good mass market book for learning about algorithms, uh, but I've written like two dissertations on computer human interaction <laughs> and uh, for me this is very shallow it's kind of like I don't know if you did A-level chemistry but when you do GCSE chemistry you learn a bunch of things and at the very start of A-level chemistry they're like oh all of the things that we taught you before we were lying like it was it was it's so complicated the thing that we're going to teach you now that teaching a dumbed down version isn't even right so we're just going we just taught you something wrong it kind of feels like that and that it's like level one of thinking about algorithms um but really it's not holistic at all and it hasn't really i feel like this would have been much better written by somebody that has spent decades in the world of computers and algorithms and not a mathematician because the context is like a lot wider than just like the mathematical facts of algorithms and she's done a good job of like researching and talking to people but you can't really be like working day to day with algorithms. I'm gonna talk about one thing I specifically didn't like about it though. Um, so for context, I'm a professional programmer. Uh, I'm a web developer most of the time. And um, I did a master's in computational art. So I've thought a lot about art and computers. And there's a chapter in this about art. Um, and I think it really, really misses the mark. It makes this baseline assumption that computers can't make art and I think that's really problematic in the first place but also really misses the fact that we make the computers. This book externalizes the machine so much that it forgets that we control the machine completely. Like even if an AI algorithm we don't understand how it's doing the thing, we made and trained the thing, you know? I think this promotes like fear of the machine a bit um, like a lot of it is breaking down fear of the machine but it is also like hey the computer's been more than you the whole time and uh, that really bothers me. If you have no idea about how algorithms influence your daily life um, I would recommend this to just as just an overview in the same way that like I'd read any popular non-fiction book just to get an idea this will give you a good idea so there's, there's that.
The next book I have is Wild Sog SOC by Jean Rhys. This was first published in 1966 and it is a sort of prequel to Jane Eyre. So there are going to be spoilers for Jane Eyre in this chat. Uh, yeah, if you haven't read Jane Eyre and are afraid of the spoilers, jump to the next book, the timestamps are linked below. So Jean Rhys was born in 1890 in Dominica and she moved to England when she was 16. So she has this kind of concept, context of being a Creole woman from the West Indies. Her, I think her father was, was Welsh and her mother was a white Creole. So in Jane Eyre, one of the biggest kind of plot twists is that Mr. Rochester has this, has a wife already, this crazy woman called Bertha Mason that they keep locked up in the attic. Um, this is the story of Bertha and how she meets Mr. Rochester and um, how he's, just like the context for her kind of madness because you're supposed to like in reading Jane Eyre you're kind of like oh no it's a, it's a shame that he's like been saddled with this mad wife um he's just trying to do the best by her and also the best by himself so he can move on with his life and this is like uh no she was kind of like driven to this hysteria by him um which is like quite heavy it's like a very it's a very heavy-handed feminist retelling of what happened before the events of Jane Eyre um, but yeah, I liked it. So Bertha Mason starts this book as Antoinette Cosway. Uh, she just, it's really weird. Mr. Rochester, who is not ever said by name in this book, um, he just starts calling her Bertha and she keeps being like, stop calling me Bertha, that's not my name, my name's Antoinette. And she's like, and he just keeps being like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep calling you Bertha. What the fuck? So this is set in the 1830s in Jamaica mostly. And it's kind of a strange point in time for, that area of the world because she's in this weird racial class where she's a white creole and she's looked down on and she's poor her family are looked down on by like white recent immigrants and then also strangely looked down on by like the black working class so early on in her childhood um her family are basically forced out of the house uh by like the black community um and her like that kind of results in her her mother um going a bit mad like just not not in any basically understandably <laughs> um and then Antoinette she gets sort of sold off by her stepdad um to this man which is Mr Rochester and they get married and uh most of the book takes place on their honeymoon and it's about how they are kind of like in love and then it kind of it's like a strange power dynamic and he sort of gaslights her into her being this crazy woman that he's expecting her to be Personally, I felt a bit distant from the narrative. It felt like it was hard to tell at any moment what the two characters felt about each other and like the power dynamics going on. I don't know, maybe that was just like the language, um, but that was that was the thing that held me back from really loving this book. Um, but there, there was also the final like dozen pages are set at like in the period of Jane Eyre at Thornfield Hall um, and that was really fascinating really gratifying to just be able to see like directly the comparison um and yeah so i found it like a bit hard to read and understand and empathize with it at points but i did i just really like the whole concept of taking on this classic the next book i have to talk about is feral rewilding the land sea and human life by george membio rewilding is the act of just letting nature do its thing as it has done very successfully for millions and millions of years. So basically instead of us trying to do all of these environmental programs to reintroduce like a single species in an area, you just let let an area go. Just like don't do don't interfere with it at all and it will like regenerate naturally. This was an interesting read and there are a couple things I want to pick out specifically. A is that sheep are evil like sheep are just the worst thing for the UK highlands and even more so uh, EU farming subsidies are like a fucking farce so like environmental protection ones actually more cases than not end up hurting the environment or just not doing as well as just leaving it alone would don't want to get all like Brexity political on you but um this man has some proper things to say he's not like a Brexit or anything but I mean this was even before that argument this was this was published in 2014 but he has a lot of interesting talks about um, EU farming and fishing regulations and their result on the local wildlife and also on the people who are, they are there to support. Um, so interesting from that perspective. Um, B is that he's also talking about 
a reintroducing species that are no longer in a certain area. Um, so specifically to the UK about beavers and wolves. They happen to be two species that cause this thing called trophic cascades, where they have kind of like knock on effects on the whole ecosystem in a really, really healthy way. Like having beavers, for example, um, their, their dams slow the river, which means that there's less, that it like lowers the chance of uh, flooding in low plains. And they actually vastly increase the quantities of salmon in the river um, just by them existing, even if they are eating the salmon. The salmon just has a, a better environment to thrive anyway. That was an interesting point and something I never really thought of, but makes so much sense. It would be really, really hard to read this book and not agree with him. <laughs> like, he just seems so right. Um, and he's talking mostly about the UK, um, specifically Wales and Scotland, actually, and how we're actually a bit behind Europe. Like, Europe has done quite well in rewilding. It seems to be something that's really over the last like couple decades um, grown in fashion or like recognised as maybe, you know, maybe we're not as good environmentalists as like actual nature is. Um, so it seems to be there are a lot of schemes across Europe for these kind of um, interventions or anti-interventions um, and he's just like promoting more of them and I think that's good. Um, I didn't really like his personal stories in this so much. I feel like every chapter started with, and it does, it's not explained for a while, it's like I was in the canoe going up the whatever canal and blah 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 blah, blah um, and didn't buy into that so much. But overall really interesting read and I, this was actually a book club pick, I got to choose the options for, for, for a book club um, and they were around the theme of kind of like nature and our relationship to nature and one of the oh the salt path was also one of the ones I had as a choice um, and this one won and we're gonna have that discussion next week and I think this is like a good book club book because it has a lot of pertinent thoughts um, about our natural world so yeah the next book I have is The Spy Who Came In From The Cold by Jean Le Carre. This was published in 1963 and you know, it's a spy book. That's exactly what it is. It is the epitome of a spy book. It is the perfect form of what it's trying to do. You know, it's the Cold War, it's some men doing some tricks, fighting, you know. Um, it's excellent. I just don't care about spy books. That's my conclusion. Like, I thought it was, it was good. And I recognise that it was like, an excellent example of a spy novel, just don't really care about them. Um, one thing is that the blurb literally ruined this for me. There's, I I'm, I'm think that I'm quite an astute reader and I know that everybody in the world thinks that, um, but like the way the blurb is phrased, I just shouldn't have read the blurb before I started reading it, but it kind of explains exactly what the twist is if you're reading it carefully enough, you know? like. And that's so, it's like, you know there's gonna be a twist anyway, to be fair, but like, you know, double twist. Anyway, um, this is, uh, yeah. The other, the other thing I didn't like about it, and this is not a fault of the book, it's a fault of me. Um, it's just really about men. It's just so about men. Like, that's a man, that's a man. There's a man, 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 man. Sorry, a young woman is mentioned, but like, it's just very, it's very male centric and uh, I'm just like really over reading super male narratives where there like aren't very strong women or the strong women are just completely downtrodden. Um, yeah, personally, really over that. Don't want to read much more of these, so I'm going to stop. But that brings me very well onto my last book, which is the opposite of that, um, which is Motherhood by Sheila Hetty. This came out last year. And as you can guess, it's just a book about motherhood. It is a uh, fiction um, and it's about this woman through the ages of 35 and 40. She's a writer and she's writing it in the first person about herself, um, just meditating on whether she wants to be a mother and really, really psychoanalyzing herself into whether, whether she's making the right choices and whether she's going to regret those choices and the societal expectations of mothers and motherhood and etc. You know, you get the idea. Like 15 pages in, I thought this would be a five star book. I was really loving it. Uh, but towards the end, I just, I felt like it was kind of looping over itself in a very sort of selfish way. It's like reading someone's diary where obviously they're gonna be the main character. Obviously they're the most important person in the world to them, but it is still just like quite exhausting. One thing I 
absolutely love about this though um, is that in this narrator's fictional life um, she's writing a few books and one of those things is about this thing called the I Ching I think it is yeah I Ching it's a divination system that originated in China over 3,000 years ago uh, by flipping three coins six times one of 64 states is revealed and a text elaborates their meaning so it's basically just like flipping coins to determine fate um, and it's used as a narrative device in maybe like a third maybe a quarter of the prose is just her posing a question flipping a coin and then responding to that um, and it even says before the book started in, in this book all the results from the flipping of coins result from the flipping of actual coins which means that the writer the author had to um, like do the coin flip and then write as if just write a genuine response to that um, and I think it's kind of facetious. There's a lot of mysticism in this book, obviously, if she's like believing in whatever the coin flips are. Uh, she's aware of how kind of ludicrous it is, but it's still there. Um, but there is one passage where she she kind of explains or elaborates on the, the concept of the coins, which I think is really lovely and what I felt like when I first saw them. There's a bit of preamble here about her boyfriend, something about boobs. Did you understand that I was feeling insecure about my breasts? Yes. Was he in fact disappointed by the inadequacy of my breasts as you touch them? No. Oh well, that's too bad. It's too bad I projected that onto him, just as I'm projecting onto you coins, the wisdom of the universe. But it's useful, this, as a way of interrupting my habits of thought with a yes or a no. I feel like my brain is becoming more flexible as I use these coins. When I get an answer I don't expect, I have to push myself to find another answer, hopefully a better one. It's an interruption of my complacency, or at least that's what it feels like, to have to dig a little deeper, to be thrown off. My thoughts don't just end where they normally would. And I think that sentiment is just really delectable. Um, I like the idea of just just having having to really examine your thoughts by being confronted with an answer, like a, a straight yes or no answer to any question you have, even if it's like plucked from thin air. It has made me think a lot about partnership and about bodily autonomy and about um, about just questioning yourself when you have no other scope. It's like saying, I have a doubt about this thing, but I have no context for whether the amount of doubt I have is the appropriate amount of doubt to have, you know? Um, it's a very, and it's the kind of thing you can run circles in in your head about any kind of big personal decision. Um, and I think she deals with that really delicately and well, even if it is a, a bit like exhaustive <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, if you are thinking about motherhood or thinking about thinking about motherhood, or thinking about thinking about not motherhood um this is an interesting book to read and that narrative device is just just so gorgeous one more thing there was a quote i was going to read from feral that i forgot to when i was talking about it but i want to read it now because it's just quite nice um so a lot of his book is just the economic and environmental reasons for rewilding and stuff and then he says i'll not try to disguise my reasons for wanting to see missing animals reintroduced it is not as a previous chapter might have suggested the desire to control floods or reduce erosion or hinder the spread of disease, that all of these might be useful side effects. My reasons arise from my delight in the marvels of nature, its richness and its limitless capacity to surprise, from the sense of freedom, of the thrill that comes from roaming in a landscape or seascape without knowing what I might see next, what might loom from the woods or water, what might be watching me without my knowledge. It is the sense that without these animals the ecosystem is lopsided, abridged, dysfunctional. I can produce reasons scientific, economic, historic and hygienic, but none of these describe my motivation. And it is just one of those like, yes, nature, I want nature for the sake of nature. And it's just fabulous, fabulous. Wow, I am getting quite sweaty because of all of my passion. So much passion. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know if you've read any of those books and what you thought about them down below in the comments. Um, I'll see you there and I'll see you next month. Bye.